Uh, good evening, welcome everybody. Um, I have again Ben from Bible Outreach on YouTube. Um, and today we're going to discuss a point that has been raised and discussed for hundreds of years, but more recently uh, within the comment section, I think. Um, so what we're gonna discuss is keeping of the law of Moses, as opposed to uh, salvation by faith and grace alone. So in essence, do must Christians keep the law of Moses in order to attain salvation? So uh, with that, I'll let Ben open and then I'll just chime in as usual. Yeah, so the reason why we're doing this discussion, as, as you said, is because that there's been somebody in particular um, who's been making videos uh, exposing Christianity and saying that to be saved, we have to keep the law and you know the old covenant law and things like that. And before we start, I'm not saying that we should um, unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament, because then we'd be dabbling in Marcionism, which was an early Christological heresy, which throws out the entire Old Testament. I'm not saying we should throw out any of the Old Testament, we should keep it. But when we try to, when we read the Bible and try to understand the covenants, we have to read the Bible within the context and within the storyline of the covenants between God and his, and his people. Yes. Because in the Old Testament, the Old Testament covenant was made for the nation of Israel and it had certain requirements that would separate them from the rest of the nations. And the, the, you know, the Old Testament um, has many laws that we are no longer actually bound to as new covenant Christians. Um, for example, uh, Leviticus chapter 19 verse nine says that you shouldn't wear mixed fabric in your clothing. Now I'm pretty sure the gentleman who's been bringing all this up wears mixed fabric in his clothing if you see his videos. So he's not keeping that, so, so he's not keeping that law. Uh, you know, De Deuteronomy 22 verse eight says that you should have a fence around your roof to stop anyone falling off. No, but that law is no longer applicable to us. We don't apply that uh, law in our lives. We're not bound by that law anymore. And of course, um, sorry to interject, but there are uh, rules, guidance, ordinances, commandments, uh, in fact, related to temple worship. And of course, those can't be observed by anybody um because the temple was destroyed as we know so i just thought oh uh, yeah yeah that, yeah that's 100 percent right yeah that's um again that, the, the context is key you have to bear the context in mind of all these covenants and the storyline of the bible itself mm -hmm. so as, as you can see there are many commandments in the old testament law that we no longer um, that we no longer follow as christians we aren't required to keep these certain commandments because that particular covenant was for the people of israel to separate them from the rest of the nations mm -hmm. and we don't follow those commandments anymore because we are under a new covenant. We are under covenant of grace, yes. which is actually funny enough. This, um, I'm going to say his name, the beard bloke, because he's been making videos, um, bringing all this up, saying we should keep the Old Testament law. Well, it's the Old Testament that prophesies a new covenant. The Old Testament actually prophesies a new covenant, a new law. Um, in Jeremiah 31, in Ezekiel, both those places prophesy a new covenant that is to come. So when we read the New Testament in light of the Old Testament, we see that the Old Covenant has passed away and that we are under a new covenant, which is a covenant of grace. And th this isn't just Ben and Kay making this up. We aren't making this up. This isn't our words put into the Bible. This is the New Testament authors themselves. And this is Jesus. In, this is Jesus himself. In Jesus in his own words, uh, the famous passage in Luke 22, verse 20, Jesus says, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this is the cup, <clears throat> excuse me, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So according to Christ himself, there is a new covenant. And that covenant is by his atoning work on the cross, his blood being poured out for the sins of many. He is the mediator uh, of that covenant, as we're told. He, 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 in, exactly. In, in, in quite numerous verses. Yeah. He, he, exactly, you're right. Uh, Paul goes on to explain this in his writings in um. Romans chapter 7 verse 6 he says and notice this key part there he says but now we have been released from the law having died to that by which we were bound so that we may serve in the newness of the spirits and not in the oldness of the letter so according to Jesus he has brought in the new covenant with the shedding of his blood according to Paul we because of this new covenant we have died to the law we've been released to the law and we are now alive in the new covenant which is a covenant of grace and Hebrews puts it even more bluntly. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13 says, In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete 
and what is becoming obsolete you couldn't get and growing. Than that. You literally exactly. couldn't get any more specific. Exactly. And what is growing old is already, excuse me, what is growing old is ready to vanish away. So you see, according to Jesus, according to Paul, this new covenant is what we Christians are to follow. And this is a new covenant of grace. We aren't saved by the works of the law. We can't be saved by the works of the law. Paul also writes elsewhere, if you're failed in one aspect of the law, you failed in the whole law. So to say we are saved by the Old Testament law, what you're trying to do there, all due respect to this, this gentleman, he's trying to have one foot in the old covenant and he's trying to dip his toe in the new covenant. I'm sorry, you can't do that. You must leave the old covenant behind and enter the new covenant with, with uh, Christ himself. Yeah. And um, yeah, sorry. And he, Hebrews 9 verses uh, 15 says it bluntly too. For this reason, Christ is the mediator, as you just said, Kay, of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promise, the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant, so you see, the, fir the first covenant, sins we were committed under it, we were yeah. uh, bound by that. The new covenant had come in, released us, as Paul says, from the old covenant. And now we are saved by this new covenant of grace, which is by the atoning work of Christ. Yeah. So I think the, one of the key uh, points within that is that um, prior to the law of Moses, even though we see that there were instances of uh, sacrifices and harvests being offered, um, they weren't specifically sat down and told to do that necessarily. So they knew of um, the way God interacts with uh, creation, how he, you know, desires to be honoured, etc. But once the law was there, it's basically an accuser and an indicator and a, a bringer of consciousness about sin. So now we know not only is sin in the world and the wages of sin are what they are, but now we know how it, at that point in time to atone for them, what these sins are. Um, you know, how serious God finds a sin to be, how he can't have it near him. And therefore we have a, a foreshadowing of Christ in those, in the sacrificial law of Moses, which is obviously done away with now because um, we have the blood of the spotless lamb. We don't need to uh, run around sacrificing animals uh, to atone for sins or, you know, any of the other reasons that they were sacrificed. So I have a couple of verses here which support um, the case that you're making. So one of them um, is Ephesians 2, 8, and that says quite plainly, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. So if it was anything to do with us and our keeping of the law, um, yeah, that would surely have been referenced or refuted um, by other New Testament writers, and yet we find it, it there. Uh, Romans 3 it says now we know that whatever the law says it says to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law rather through the law we became conscious of our sin but now apart from the law the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So that's literally, again, reiterating in quite strong terms that this is the only way to, be, to have your sins atoned. The blood of Christ is, for Christians at least, the um, only means of salvation, along with obviously confessing him as Lord, believing in your heart um, and being born again and baptized. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, you're 100% no, no, right. Lord. Yeah, you're right. Because if you want to, as this gentleman is trying to say, you have to keep the law in order to be righteous. And, and um, he actually said in his own words that if you fail, then you have Jesus as an atoning work. So as this could be... Well, yeah, the beard bloke seems to think that it's both law and atoning work of Christ. Mm. So it's like the law, you know, you keep the law best you can, go as far as you can, and then Jesus is going to take you the rest of the way. Yeah. But that's not what any of the verses we've just read says. I mean, there is only two so ways. It's going against Christ's own words and okay. the New Testament writers. So 
you're you're in effect and i don't mean this uh, guy at all because i haven't watched any of his videos and you know so i can't comment on those but what i would say that if you're directly contradicting the words of christ if or the new testament writers even if they are saying that it is by uh, grace alone that you are saved uh, there's another verse that says for by no means will any man be justified by works of law because then you could have the ridiculous setup that um you know a polytheist could uh, attempt at least to uh you know perfectly keep the law um a satanist could keep the law quite well and have additional satanic rituals i don't know on a friday and um and still have some uh, favor with the lord which is clearly not the case so but if you rely on christ alone through faith alone and grace alone you can't really go wrong because there's no element of that whereby you could fall short we all fall short of the glory of god and that is why we have to have a perfect sacrifice and a perfect covering of the blood in order to um yeah it, i don't understand um the argument i understand the argument i don't agree with the argument that the workings i don't say that See, this is the thing. If you have the Holy Spirit through the, your confession of Christ and through your faith in God, you don't want to break the law anyway. You're not running around murdering people and saying, oh, now I'm saved. I can uh, tell lies and dishonor my parents and, um, you know, commit theft. What happens is the fruits of um, your faith, the fruits of the Spirit will produce righteous works or good works. So that's referenced in James, but they aren't the key to salvation alone. They're as filthy rags to the Lord. They are of no consequence whatsoever, and I'm renting. So carry on, man. No, 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 no you're, you're 100% right. Because if, if we can be saved by the works of the law, by keeping the law, then what's the point of Christ dying on the cross? Mm -hmm. Because if, I mean, if, if he died on the cross and we could go to heaven just by being good, then he's died in vain. Yeah. Um, he died on the cross because we can't go to heaven by ourselves based on our own good works, mm -hmm. as you said all have fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. Therefore, we've fallen short of God's perfect standard. Yeah. It took a perfect man, Jesus, to fulfill that perfect standard and then die on the cross in the place of those who haven't fulfilled that perfect standard. So if, if you want to say that we can keep, uh, keep the law and be saved that way, then Christ's death was, was quite frankly, in vain. Yeah. So, the, I mean, if, if you look at it this way, I mean, if, if we don't need Christ's death to atone for us and go to heaven, then as you said, any Tom, Dick or Harry who's good enough can go to heaven. When yeah. according to the Bible, that's not what the Bible teaches. You see, there, there is only two ways you can stand before God and Judgment Day. You can either stand before God, trusting in your own good merit, in your own good works, in which case, as you just quoted, we were fouled because all have fallen short, and yeah. all means all, we've all fallen short. So because of that, we would all fail in that situation. Mm -hmm. Or you can stand before the judgment seat, of, of God in Christ covered because of his atoning work in which case you will be uh, standing before God as if you had never committed any sin before because what happened on the cross is that God treated his son as if he had lived our lives and yeah. now treats us as if we have lived his life because of his atoning work I mean it's like this imagine uh, imagine there's a homeless man on the streets and um, he can't afford to go in the shop he keeps trying to go in the shop but they kick him out because he's got no money whatsoever and suddenly a man who's got money and credit in his account finds the homeless man on the street and says, come with me, come into the shop. I'll, you know, you, ch you choose what you like, I'll pay for it. And then that homeless man goes to the counter and then the, the, the server behind the counter says, what are you doing in here? You've got nothing to pay for. Mm -hmm. That homeless man can then say, I'm with him because he has credit. Yeah. And that's what we're doing really on judgment day. We can say, I'm with him. I've got nothing. I, I, my merit is nothing. I have no credit in my account. I'm with him, I'm with Jesus, therefore I can come in. Yeah. So I think also a distinction to make is um, the law uh, of like a fleshly law as opposed to uh, a law of the spirit. So um, God has displayed to us um, in legalistic terms in the Old Testament. And I'm, you know, for, for anybody who's under the old covenant, um, for sure you must try to keep the law if that's your um if that's your belief in God, if you don't have Christ and yet you like, if you're a Jew, basically, then by all means, I'm not, I'm not really speaking to you. I'm speaking to people who claim Christ and then dishonor him because in my opinion, however humble it might not come across actually, but the fact is that a gift cannot be worked for. If somebody gives me a gift and I try to pay them for it, 
it no longer is a gift it's a, basically a delivery service it's, it's so, wages exactly so the wages of sin is death but with this free gift of salvation um basically it's insulting if somebody gives you a gift and you try to pay for it they'd be within their rights to take slight offense at that even if it's from good intentions even if you want to do the things that within the old testament please the lord um nothing saying that it will displease him but by trying to claim on judgment day but i kept this law and yet i have no faith in your words literally to christ when he says and so do the other new testament writers this is not the way no man will be justified by these works of law keep them by all means but don't assume that they'll bring you salvation because the chances are you'll be told uh, i never knew you so yeah exactly i mean if you want to argue for the position that we can be saved through works and things like this as this gentleman is trying to do then ultimately you have to call paul a liar you have to call peter a liar you have to call uh, Luke a liar. You have to call Jesus a liar. Mm. So as you said, when you do that, it dishonours Christ, the one who he claims to follow. Yeah. I, I guess my other thing would be uh, Galatians speaks of the fruits of the Spirit. So again, I kind of touched on it briefly earlier. But if you have the Spirit with you, and if you have faith in Christ, and uh, you're worshipping uh, the triune God, at least of the New Testament and the Old Testament, but if you're a Christian, in other words, um, the fruits of the spirit will produce um, something like adherence to the law. Obviously, two types of fabric. I'm sorry, I don't consider that a sin. I don't, and that is why we must disregard the law in that respect because the minutiae of it would uh, keep you busy just forever, and you wouldn't get to do the real fruits of the spirit, which are peace, patience, kindness. You know, um, being uh merciful to others being loving and because as christ says the two greatest commandments anyway are to love the lord uh with all your heart soul and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself and if you do those two things so you're loving humanity and you're loving god there's no real room for um for terrible sin like if you honestly love somebody you don't want to steal from them you don't want to murder them you don't want to dishonor them you don't want to covet what they have um, and likewise, if you love the Lord, you'll go by his words. You won't attempt to break the laws. But at the same time, you'll know that it, it matters little. The thief on the cross um, was literally a thief. And um, he, by, by Christ alone, he wasn't baptized. He wasn't necessarily born again. He didn't keep any works of law um, that I know of or that are referenced. And yet we know that he will be in paradise. So yeah, that, that, that's a really good point. The thief on the cross didn't have time to run down from the cross, get baptized, sit in 300 Bible studies and evangelize for 24 years. Mm. He literally just put his simple faith in Jesus for who he was. And Jesus said, as you said, this day you will be with me in paradise. He didn't say, actually, it's too late for you. You've done no good works. Yeah. That's not the case. That, that didn't happen. So, I mean, like, like you said earlier, there are, we're not throwing out every single law in the Old Testament. For example, some of the Old Testament laws are repeated in the New Testament. Exactly. Jesus said, you know, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't murder. All of these do apply. But we aren't saved by keeping, the, to, as Paul said, keeping the letter of the law. We're not saved by that. We're under the new covenant, which is a covenant uh, of grace. So we aren't saved by trying to um, keep every dot, jittle, and, you know, every, every T cross, I dotted. Of, of the of the old testament um we are under a new covenant and it's under that new covenant which we hope the beard bloke will eventually come to uh, <laughs> i'll put that in my prayers um the holy spirit moves in mysterious ways i'm sure but um yeah you have to uh have your eyes open uh to his word and i think that all of us are somewhat guilty of uh you know if if you're just by yourself and you're reading those words potentially without the spirit because triunity is the thing that i'd like to stress um the holy spirit is referenced as god and blasphemy of the spirit is unforgivable um so therefore we know that the spirit is god we know that the son is god because he says so and so and others worship him he doesn't rebuke them he um you know he he claims to to be able to give eternal life he gives sight to the poor which is an attribute of god like god is, we're told that god gives sight to the blind in the old testament and here is christ doing it again in the new um not to mention john one we also 
everybody knows at this point that the father is God and he's the only one true God. And he knows of no other God, even though he points to Christ as um, his word. So therefore we know that the three, those three persons, not an inactive force, not a depersonalized energy, the spirit is God, Christ is God and the father is God. So even I believe without the triune nature of God, still you're, you're off the mark when it comes to the New Testament and the Old Testament, actually. There, there are countless instances of uh, triunity in the Old Testament. Yeah, you're right. I mean, um, in regards to the triunity in the Old Testament, you have um, uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, mm -hmm. where it speaks of in the plural. It says, and God made, uh, God says, let us make man in our image. Mm -hmm. And then in verse 27, it goes to the singular, and God made them, he made them in, in his image. It goes from plural to singular. In, in also, the we have an instance, and I can't remember the verse off because I just thought of it off the top of my head, when uh, God says, and I will rain down fire from God in heaven. So he says, he speaks about himself in, um, in a plurality, basically. Also, the uh, angel of his presence. We have cases where um, God is telling them, listen to him for my name is in him. He will not forgive your transgressions. And as we all know, the only person who can forgive sin is God. So God is exactly. pointing to another part of himself who is with them as God. Um, and there are a couple more that I can maybe post the links to in the comments. But I yeah. think... And it's, sorry. Oh, sorry. I was, I was going to say, and it's this triune God that you're speaking about who established the Old Testament covenant and who also established and fulfilled in his son the uh, new covenant and if you try to go back to the old covenant and keep the law and try to be saved that way then you remind me of the person paul speaks to in galatians when those people are saying you have to be circumcised in order to to be a christian and be saved what does paul say to them what does paul say to them go the whole way if you want to go back to circumcision go the whole way so even paul says those who are trying to go back to the old testament covenant there's nothing there's nothing for you there yes. we're in the new yes. we're in the new covenant yeah, but what he's trying to say there is there's nothing for you in the old covenant. We're no longer there. We are now in under the new covenant, and that's where we uh, ought to come to in Christ. I think that's where the difference also lies. That some of the New Testament writers are writing specifically to a Jewish audience. Others have a mixed audience of Jews and Gentiles. But obviously, we know that it says there is neither Jew or Gentile. Um, so that's negated um, after because the new covenant engrafts into Israel and therefore it's of little relevance, um, the heritage or the bloodline that you have, because now we're under the blood of Christ, which is obviously uh, far supreme to any kind of heritage. But I think unless you've got anything else pressing, I think we've kind of, I mean, we haven't exhausted not by any means the verses that we could have used to support the argument, but I think I kind of feel that I've put my case at least. And um, I think maybe you have too, if you've got anything to add to wrap up. Yeah, yeah, just on your last point, you're 100% right, because the old covenant was for the people of Israel. Mm -hmm. The new covenant engrafts Gentiles into this, into this uh, grace of God. So you have the old covenant, which was specifically for the nation of Israel to separate them from the rest of the nations. The new covenant is for uh, Jew and Gentile under, in Christ. And that's where it has to be in Christ, not in the letter of the law. But, in the grace of Christ. That's it. Amen. All right. Well, I'm pretty confident by now, at least on my channel, that I'll get to hear your thoughts about this video in the comment section. Um, so, yeah, feel free to let me know. Um, you know, if you've got any verses that you, additional verses that you think are helpful for future um, discussion of this topic, or if you have any other topics that you'd like to see Ben and I discuss then um, let me know. Remember to subscribe, like, share, etc. Bible Outreach, two words. It comes up pretty quickly in the search description of YouTube. That's uh, Ben's channel, and I'll put a link to that in the comments. And um, yeah, Ben, thank you very much for speaking to me today. And hopefully, yeah, like you say, hopefully some, some people watching who may have been under um, an illusion about works of law, maybe they'll uh, potentially reconsider, have some like a bit of humility, like we all must do, and uh, look again at the verses and pray for guidance and uh, discernment. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one more thing, um, but this isn't going to be a continuous thing, by the way. Me and Kay aren't going to keep responding to this particular gentleman. 
Um, we've done this because somebody in the comments asked us to do so. So we, we've done that for, uh, for them. So this isn't going to be a continuous cycle of responding to this particular guy. So Brilliant. But God bless you all, including anyone who thinks that you have to have the law. I mean, try it out, but yeah, I don't think you'll get very far. All right, so God bless everybody and um, see you next time.